Someone wanted to just say they'd never been advised of their HLA. Is it something that's more a medical thing so the patient doesn't really find out about it? They're not told their results. Um, well, as, as you saw when I put my tissue type on screen, it's, it's basically a list of letters and numbers and doesn't really mean an awful lot in terms of you can't compare it to anything but um, any patient who contacts us and that we do get patients contacting us occasionally and asking about their HLA type and their antibody status we always then write back to their nephrologist with all that information and then they can sit down with the nephrologist and talk through it when they're next in clinic with them. Um, we also here at Manchester started something called Transplant Immunology Clinic um, so patients who were, you know, had a particular HLA problem, um, had lots of antibodies, wanted to know about their options. We do have like an MDT, but with the patient. So we have a consultant nephrologist, um, one of the recipient coordinators comes along um, and then myself and my laboratory director attend and we talk the patient through all their results as well at that time. Mm -hmm. And you mentioned the antibodies there and that was one of the things well people always have antibodies I know in your slides you said with an infection it can come and go sometimes an antibody but usually it's pregnancy or if you've had previous transplant or perhaps a blood transfusion so can we have a little bit more information about these antibodies yeah so the um, how long your antibodies are detectable for can be influenced by how you got the antibodies in the first place so um, transfusion induced antibodies tend to disappear from your circulation much quicker than ones that you get through pregnancy or transfusion. Um, as I showed you, antibodies, you know, they, they change, they come and go, and it may be that um, an antibody gets to a level where we'd be happy to do a transplant, even though they have had that antibody in the past, but it would mean maybe extra immunosuppression um, and, prob you know, discussion because they would be a slightly increased risk of getting rejection post-transplant. Uh -huh. And is there a quick way of finding out your HLA or do you really have to wait till you're on the workup towards transplant to find that out? Um, if you've been tested, then that result can be available to you, um, preferably through your nephrologist, I would imagine. Um, we normally t start testing people quite early in their transplant workup. So once patients, it's been decided that renal transplantation is an option for them, we would start collecting samples from them and test them as we go along so that when they're ready, when they've had the medical workup, we'd be in a position to get them straight onto the transplant list. That's lovely. Thank you. I'm just scrolling down to see if any other questions have come in. Uh, there was a... The, yeah, there was a question about a living donor, somebody who's a living donor for a brother and uh, too, too, too much, too, too, too much. How will that work out for them? Well, the benefits of living donation in that it's an elective procedure, it's planned and that, um, that you've got a really healthy donor because they've gone through intensive workup um, means that the, and the cold ischemia times are always shorter with living donation as well. So all of those factors put together sort of balances out the fact that it's not a very well matched kidney. Um, so the actually the, the graft outcome in living donor 222s is comparable with well matched deceased donors. Okay, thank you. Interesting. Thank you. There was another quick question um, asking about how do you know what your blood group is, <laughs> which, which, uh... um, that should have been tested <laughs> multiple times when you're in in a hospital, so it should be available through through your GP. Even you should. Be it's it's, it's it. not the first time I've heard that question actually. I found my not... blood group out at school because we did um, ABO blood grouping in a biology class. <laughs> Yeah, it's not something that tends to be put on your clinic letter. Mm. Um, I think that was all the matching tissue typing questions. Mm -hmm. Now we've got a range of a um, couple of living donor questions, uh, more about uh, somebody asking, when can somebody be tested? There were two 
similar questions. When can somebody tested to be a living donor? And another who said they're now EGFR of 29 with three potential living donors. So when is the best time to start that process um, of, being of being tested? Uh, I don't know who would like to pick up on that question, answer that question. Soon? Yes, thank you, Hussain, yeah. Essentially, I'd say as soon as possible, get tested for anybody who's looking towards being transplanted. Um, we wouldn't transplant until the EGFR is 15 or less, really, um, because it could be quite a long time. But you know, It may have fallen rapidly to 29, but if it's another five years before it gets to 15 and needing dialysis, then that's five years that you save not having had a transplant. Um, but you can be tested. Um, certainly the blood tests and compatibility tests can be done relatively straightforward so that you know who's a match if and when that progresses further. Um, so I would get the conversation about live donors started very, very early. Um, and if people come forward, then speak to your nephrologist about them uh, and ask them to contact the live donor team at your local transplant centre. But sooner rather than later. Mm. Thank you for that. Um, question uh, sort of related, but probably for Nicola uh, around, uh, it was somebody who asked, uh, was hoping to be eligible for a transplant, which I'm presuming uh, uh, that's going to happen to them, but struggling with thinking about asking someone to undergo surgery uh, with the risk. So, uh, you know, I think that's something that uh, many of us uh, struggle with. Uh, you know, how do you ask family member, a friend, a co-worker, etc., when you know it's going to entail uh, a surgical procedure? I think, I think the honest answer, as you probably expect, is that there isn't a magical way of asking that question. And those feelings are completely understandable in terms of those worries that we would have about our own health, but certainly about those dear to us undergoing any kind of surgery. And I suppose the most obvious answer I can give is is probably that it is just about having an open conversation about those worries with that person um, and then having the opportunity to talk through those worries with your care team both from a recipient point of view but also in terms of what that donor can expect um, and I think that's it, it's incredibly difficult isn't it they're conversations that none of us would be want to be having and certainly wouldn't expect to be having um, so I think the only way that any of those worries or concerns can sort of be laid to rest and they may never be fully laid to rest is by having those open conversations between yourselves but also then having the opportunity to talk that through with the care team and I suppose also to do that separately and um, that the donor may have questions that they might want to ask that they don't want the recipient to hear and vice versa um, and obviously that the donor may decide not to pursue, not to proceed with um, with the process. And I think that in itself can obviously be very stressful for families or for friendships or for colleagues, um, whoever it is that might be coming forward. Um, so I suppose it's just a, there's a completely normal reaction to have to any of these conversations that you're having, which are unusual anyway. Um, but yes, to draw on the support that's around you, whether that is from the care team individually or from the support network that you have away from hospital. Thank you. Sorry, I've, Tess, I've, I've just dropped the slides. Hopefully now that the audience should be able to see the, the panelists that are still, uh, are still here. Can, is, is, can you all see that? Yeah. Right, because mm -hmm. you can see that still got a guy. I'm just very conscious that uh, we, we had to sort of we, we had to sort of we, we didn't do a q a with you guys so just want people to be aware that we've, we've still got hussein we have sean we have uh, nicola judith and guy so if there are any questions about the, the, the ward stay for example or then, then guy's still here mm -hmm. um i've got a question here for hussein which came up a couple of times it was a comment that you might have made earlier about a patient passing most of the urine during the night and a nighttime kidney. Is that, uh, I don't know if you remember that comment. I wish, I wish I had a pound for every time I was asked about a nighttime <laughs> kidney. I'd be very rich right now. <laughs> um, I also wish I had an answer for it. I don't, I'm afraid. Uh, transplant kidneys, I, we very, very often find patients complaining of having to be up in the middle of the night passing urine multiple times, 
more often at night than during the day. Uh, I don't know why. Uh, there's no reason for it as such. Um, there's nothing in the medical literature about it, but it does seem to be a very, very common thing. Uh, I am told by patients that it settles down with time. Oh, good. I, I put it down to the way I sleep at night, but I'm crushing my kidney. It just wants to get rid of the urine. <laughs> it's a theory, Tess. It's a theory. It's N equals one. Absolutely. <laughs> but, but there's more people. I'm, I'm inter That's very interesting. Thank very, you. Very and another couple of questions that come in regarding, we know it does happen occasionally in our community, is a dual transplant of the kidney and the liver. So I was looking How at that. How common is that? Yeah, it's very, very uncommon. Incredibly uncommon. Um, with polycystic kidney disease, it's very rare, but you can get cysts in your liver. Um, the, the anomaly is that the cysts don't affect the liver function. So you never need a liver transplant because of um, a decline in your liver function. You very, very rarely need a combined liver and kidney transplant if the liver becomes so big that it's causing mass effect on your other organs. Okay, so if it's got so much space that you can't eat and drink because there's no space for your stomach, for example, then it may need a transplant. Yeah. Uh, and it's incredibly uncommon. In the UK, I mean, I don't work at a liver centre, and if it was a combined liver and kidney transplant, it would be done at a liver transplant centre. But I would say the numbers are in the region of single figures per year. Thank you. Yeah, and for they, those they whose yeah. ears maybe perked up a little bit when we mentioned PLD, uh, we have a lovely recently updated section on our own website. So if you were to go into the PKD charity web pages, there's a section on PLD, and you'll also find a recent recording of a webinar we had posted just when the topic came up. <laughs> so that's that. Uh, uh, we've got somebody, it's a, it could be a pharmacy type question or possibly for Zane. Uh, someone who saw a renal urologist specialist who said they were on too much immune suppression and is worried about having to go through through it again if they have another if they have another transplant I presume because they, they were taking a lot of medication and they were struggling and they say they were struggling to cope with it um, I don't have any more information than that I just wanted to one or both of you could comment I think it'd be difficult to comment on a specific patient scenario mm. if I'm honest um, we'd probably need more information and a piece of background. Sorry. Thank you. Um, a bit of a futuristic question here about the artificial kidney. I would say that it's a very highly visited page on our website. It's a blog from about four years ago that we wrote, and it's still <laughs> visited regularly. I guess it shows the interest in the artificial kidney uh, projects that are going on around the world but uh, uh, just some comments on it and uh, how how you would integrate it into your current way of handling transplants. <laughs> so I think if it was, depending which one you use of course to any which artificial if kidney. If it was an artificial use. kidney that we could implant it make our jobs much easier um, probably nine to five it would be lovely uh, but I know there's a huge amount of work going into growing organs um, biomechanical organs. Um, I think, unfortunately, certainly for the kidney, we're a long, long way away from being able to grow organs in a lab or implant biomechanical organs that can replace a transplant. Um, there's a bit of animal work that's been published over the last few years, um, but it's really proof of concept and safety rather than efficacy. Um, so I think we're a long, long way away from being able to do that. Yeah. Indeed, some of that was done at Manchester, I think, the uh, growing the nephron yep. in the, yeah, the mouse, mouse. Was, yeah, yeah, yeah. It was in fact a Manchester yes. team. So we're waiting for the for them to grow a few more nephrons. Yeah. Yep. Bear in mind, we we're born with roughly a million nephrons. So it's quite a long way to go to replace them. I think a question that might be best directed to Guy. So many of us ask, what should we pack in our hospital bag? If we were pregnant ladies, we can go online and we will find a hospital bag list. 
in our social media groups, this question comes up on a weekly basis. What should you pack in that bag? So um, this is this is much debated amongst hospital staff as well because some people don't want any any clutter in the ward, and some people want the patients to have absolutely everything. What I always think is that if you if something is absolutely essential, we will have it for you. We'll be able to provide it, such as pajamas, gowns, things like that. If you forget them, we always ask that you bring a small supply of your medication and some comfortable clothes for for recovery. For the first couple of days, we advise that you would wear hospital gowns anyway. You know, you've got various tubes and bits and pieces. It's much easier to manage in a gown, as undignified as they may be. Um, they're much easier to change, clean and sort out if required. So I suggest probably a basic wash kit, um, your toothbrush, any sanitary stuff that you need and some pyjamas. Other than that, you know, we can provide anything. It's a bit like a hotel. If you forget something, we've got the essentials tucked away somewhere for you and we'll, and we'll provide them. Yeah. Guy, I've got a Thank question you. for you as well. Um, so... In, in regarding the current climate so with covid and, and no um visitors allowed are you mm -hmm. are you noticing any sort of difference to patient recovery or, or patient motivation levels and is it placing more strain on 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 on, on the ward team on the sort of nursing staff um I, I think that there is certainly a more social aspect to to the ward than there was previously because i think that you know for you know, the way that wards have always worked is everyone looks forward to visiting time and then you're inundated with people and requests and, and that, you know, we are there to provide kind of a holistic service for both the relatives and the patient, but it is difficult, you know, when everyone's relative arrives at the same time for visiting. I think that patients are more motivated to get home um, because they want to see the family. They get a bit, you know, rightly, you know, understandably so they get a bit more fed up they're on their own mm -hmm. as i say we had a, a lady this week ask if she could be put into a bay with someone else but as, as it happened all we had were side rooms we didn't have any patients in any bays this week we were quite low on numbers mm -hmm. and so actually she found that she missed out on the social aspect of that um yeah. I, I have got a, a meeting towards the end of next week where we're going to i'm going to discuss with the children's hospital because they have visitors they have parents on site and I'm trying to figure out exactly how they do that um, and their parents are screened for COVID in the same way that the patients are so you know we're looking at that because we're, obviously we have quite a complex client base or complex patient base and some patients do need more support than we can offer uh, whether that be for learning disabilities amongst other things so we are looking at how we can you know improve because I think as a transplant unit COVID will always be a bigger issue for us than other units because of the immunosuppressed nature of the patients. And so we're going to have to come up with a way to work past that. And like I say, we're, we're going to look at whether we can do screening of people that, you know, if people have living carers and things like that going forward. But the honest answer is that I don't know when we'll be able to have normal, in inverted commas, visiting again on the ward. Thanks, Guy. Okay, uh, there was a couple of um, questions about uh, being about fitness and exercise. So someone saying, um, was cycling a good exercise, CKD4, with PKD, would it cause a hernia? But also another with this very sort of open-ended question is, how fit do you have to be? Which um, uh, is probably a <laughs> difficult. Can I say as fit as possible? As fit as possible, exactly. That was perfect. That was a perfect. <laughs> um, I, I think a few people have asked, and I've replied to somebody, but the actual minimum criteria to get a kidney transplant is very low. And very, very few people are declined a kidney transplant purely based on fitness. Um, but the fitter you are, the better you are going to get through this transplant operation. Uh, and the better you're going to feel, the longer you're going to to live with a kidney and the more benefit you'll get from the kidney. And we really can't stress that enough. And a question that may be best answered by Nicola. Someone wants to know how they can disclose their condition to their friends and family. So it might be they're 
PKD itself and being able to openly talk and how do you bring up that topic or the need for a kidney that you've reached that stage because we know so often people will say you're looking great but you know what's happening inside your body and you're reaching that end stage. Mm -hmm. I suppose um, a truly psychologist type answer is again I will be saying it's about open communication isn't it? I don't think there's a special phrase that you can use I don't think there's a certain wording that makes it any easier, if I'm honest. I suppose I would think about kind of how we talk about anything that feels difficult to us. And I suppose I would be saying, well, I would start with talking to someone that you feel very comfortable with and almost test it out, especially if it's talking about your condition. So sort of practice often makes perfect with these things. So trying out talking to somebody that you trust and can talk to openly um, about your condition can be a good way of sort of practicing a way that feels more comfortable for you as we would talk about anything that feels difficult or personal. I suppose in terms of um, what can help, I think I would be drawing on some peer support as well, you know, in terms of this charity and others, you know, there's lots of peer support and it might be a useful thing to throw out there in terms of what other people have found helpful and less helpful. And I, and I think, you know, these will be conversations that lots of people will have had before you and lots of people will continue to have after you. So any kind of advice that you can draw on, you can pick and choose which bits you adopt yourself. I think in terms of the um, living donor conversation and how difficult that can be, um, I think, again, it might be about being open that you're in this position and that this is what you're being asked to consider. I think I would caveat that with, um, you know, sometimes people often openly talk to me about feeling a sense of disappointment at people maybe not coming forward as potential donors for them, um, particularly when they maybe have had an idea that somebody might do, whether that's a family member or a friend or a colleague. And I suppose, again, it's sort of adding to that that you know people might have a lack of understanding about what's involved so sometimes it might be providing people with information but I suppose equally it's an incredibly personal decision that people are making and the reasons that people might not come forward are very um, complex and varied you know they might have fears about their own health they might have fears about their own family's health in the future and wanting to be in a position where they might be able to donate should a family member ever come into problems so I think I suppose with most things, it is, it is being kind to yourself about it, but also kind to those around you that might be really struggling with their own feelings about not offering um, to come forward as a potential donor. Um, yeah, so I suppose there's, a, there's, a, there's no easy answer to any of those incredibly difficult conversations, but a starting point has to be trying it out and, and being a bit open about what might be going around your head. Thank you for that. So the best thing is to keep talking. <laughs> I'm always going to say that. <laughs> I, I think uh, we've probably covered most of the ones, that, nearly all the ones that were all the ones that are relevant that were still open, apart from one curious one, which I assume is because the person asking has got a cat, but asking about the risks of toxoplasmosis post transplantation. <laughs> Uh, perhaps Hussein or someone might want to answer that one. Uh, my fingers crossed you wouldn't ask me actually. <laughs> um, <laughs> gosh, toxoplasmosis. Um, we do screen for it in the donors. I don't know if they may be going because we do screen for it in the donors um, and it can, it's easily treatable with a short course of antibiotics. Um, post transplant, I don't know is the honest answer and I can find out and I'll let Jane or Alim or somebody an answer so they can forward it on. Is that okay? We do have lots of transplant patients with pets. Um, and I'm sure there's something out there about toxoplasmosis. I don't know if Sean can help. Sean, can you? I, I don't know about toxoplasmosis, but I do know lots of people do have cats and dogs and yeah. live happily and healthily. I'll have a look and I'll send some. I think, actually, I think I read a PubMed uh, paper on it, basically saying you, it was okay to have an animal that makes sure you always wash your hands, don't let them kiss you, all those sort of things. You know. Good standard hygiene practice, folks, with, with your animals. Don't let them sleep in your bed, don't let them kiss you, wash your hands after dealing with them, all that good stuff. <laughs> uh, I think 
think that's probably it. Jane, I think we've got we're... the question. I'm just thinking, Tess, there, what does this one that's just come in? What what if your potential living donor is abroad? Is it still possible for them to be considered? Yes, it oh, is. Yeah. yeah. Quite often we have we every year we have quite a few donors that come from abroad. Um, quite often a lot of the workup is done abroad and sent to us. Um, uh, and depending on where they're coming from, we can organize visas and things if needed. Um, but yes, the workup can be done abroad. We can see the patients here and do the operation here. That's it, thank you. There's still quite a few questions coming in. Just to add to that, if you have potential donors abroad, samples can be sent over to here and we can test them here. It's possible to just put them in the post basically. So if people do have people who we want to be considered, it is possible to send the samples here and us to do the, the tissue type in here. Crikey. I, I, see, I didn't know that. That's, that's, that's really helpful. The, um, the samples are fine in the post. There's no time limit on them. So it's, yeah. it's fine. Yeah. So. Susan, Tess, you got any, is there anything more in there that we've not already answered? Sorry, yeah, there was one right at the beginning, was, but I think she, the person has left according to the attendee list, but it might be still of interest. Uh, and yeah, it's to do with a, um, hmm. a, a, a kidney is donated by older people as viable as those from a younger person when, transplant, when transplanted. Uh, is it in terms of live donation or disease? I suppose doesn't say. Could be either. If I suppose, the older yes. person is otherwise fit and well then um, in a live donation, the outcomes are very, very good. Okay. Um, in a deceased donation, they, um, the younger, the better. But again, you're depending on age. You know, we often use kidneys from donors over the age of 70, um, depending on other medical conditions. And again, it depends on recipient factors as well. Um, what we would try and avoid are big age differences in deceased donation unless the recipient had specific factors that would make us think they need a kidney sooner rather than later and not wait any longer. Um, but we do use kidneys from a very age. We try and avoid large age mismatches, but we're more acceptable to them if it's live donation than deceased donation. Okay. So I've, I've got a question then, uh, Hussein. Do, do kidneys degrade or age in the same way that other parts of the body do? In other words, if you, if, if you, if you were transplanted with a 70 year old kidney, for example, yeah. is that likely just, is that likely to live the average lifespan of the person? Or do, do does that, did you understand yeah. my question? Just wait a minute. It is, it probably is likely to live the average lifespan of the donor. Yep. Yeah. Um, possibly slightly less, which is why we wouldn't, it'd be very, very rare to do, to give a 70 year old donor's kidney to a 25 year old. Yeah. Yeah because the lifespan of that kidney is never going to be what that 25 year old wants. Yeah. Unless there's really unique circumstances for that 25 year old, like they're running out of access for dialysis, for example, or they're very, very highly sensitized and would otherwise have a very long predicted wait on dialysis. But generally we would try and avoid those big age mismatches. Interesting, thanks. We have a question which is about uh, the MR, MRI and um, how long it might take to, to get listed on the national transplant list um, once, once you've started having your consultations with surgeon and um, so on and so forth. So roughly how long does that work up process take? I, obviously centres have been closed for some time so that's probably going to distort but in a, in a pre-COVID era, how long would it roughly take to, from having those first meetings to being worked up and getting onto the list, being activated? So we'd normally say an average of about six months, but it depends on how straightforward the workup is. If you're otherwise young quite well, it may be slightly shorter. If there's other um, referrals that we need to make or other investigations that we need, it may be slightly longer, but we'd say about six months. Okay, thanks. Uh, if you're happy to take another one, we've got an nephrectomy question. Oh, uh, oh, this is quite. Oh, this is really a dialysis question to do with um, preparing for dialysis. Uh, if you know you, if you, if you 
need a nephrectomy. But um, I guess that, that's to do with getting a, either a fistula or PD catheter fitted in advance of having a nephrectomy. So it's not really a transplant question as such, but... Um, so if we're if you're going to have a nephrectomy because of the polycystic kidneys, yeah, um, we would normally, if there's time, plan for dialysis or plan for access for dialysis after the nephrectomy. What you don't want to be left with is having the nephrectomy and then finding you need dialysis but not having access. So I, I think if the question's I'm understanding correctly is yes, we'd probably do a fistula first, make sure that that's working, then do the nephrectomy. So that if the patient needs dialysis straight after the nephrectomy, the fistula is ready. That would be ideal. And the, and the only option, of course, is hemodialysis because you wouldn't be able to have a peritoneal uh, catheter fitted if you were about to have a nephrectomy. Probably not. No, you couldn't. No. Yeah. But you could have it fitted and then wait you know, and then weeks till it had healed and then have the nephrectomy. Yeah. 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 Sorry, I'm very conscious. I know, I know you've been here a while. Thank you, everybody. I'm just thinking, if, if a living donor has low-grade prostate cancer, could they still donate? Um, no. This is a short answer. Okay. No active cancer. Thanks. And I think we might just take one final one, which has appeared from chat, which is about anxiety uh, and how to deal with it related to PKD, when you're watching other family members, so you're coping with your own PKD journey while looking at other family members who might be going through transplant dialysis and how to just cope with that general anxiety. I think it's, it's really difficult, isn't it? And it's really specific to PKD in that sense that you can be in this very unusual situation where not just yourself but lots of your family members are being faced with all of these challenges possibly all at the same time but at different phases um, and I suppose my the obvious thing I would be suggesting is that as individuals you seek support away from family members maybe I'm sure that people will be supporting each other as as much as they possibly can but I suppose we're often then in this position where we're so desperate to sort of look after each other that we might find that we're not saying the things that we're really feeling because we might worry that it will set off their worries or anxieties about something they might have not even thought about yet um, so I suppose I would be advising about getting your absolutely supporting each other as best you can and you have this shared experience in lots of ways but also using your individual support networks away from family members and um, if possible and I think in some ways that's where maybe a psychologist or a counsellor might come in you know that people come in as they're not a member of your family you don't have to worry about upsetting us we're not going to take offence we're not going to take things personally um, and that's the reason why sometimes talking therapies from somebody outside of your family can help. Often people might say to me, you know, what's, what's going to be different? You know, I can talk to my mates or I can talk to my family members. And I absolutely agree with that. And it's massively important. But I suppose um, a counsellor or a psychologist can free you up to not have to worry about their feelings on top of your own. Thank you. Tessa, is there any burning questions that you see there or is that us for today? No, I think that's a wrap. If, if you can just hang on a sec, guys, just a couple of lighthearted ones here. Um, John, who says he was um, given a, a, a kidney from a 39 year old at the age of six, when he was 62, now believes he's going to live till 102. <laughs> um, Rebecca, one of our trustees, uh, wanted to give a shout out to Guy. I think she might be secretly in love with you, except I do know she's, I do know she's married. She wanted to say thank you. And uh, before I hand you back to, to Tess, just do a quick wrap up. Can I just, um, just mention that you will get a, um, an email at the end of this everybody who registered, that this, this will be asking you, begging you in fact, to, to fill out our feedback form. Um, it just takes a few minutes. It's really, really important that we, we, uh, we get your feedback on today's event um, so that we can, we, can, we can improve next time round. And, and be honest, you know, we can, we can take it on the chin. We've got, most of us have got PKD. We, we're, we're used to disappointment. 
so please, please, if you could take a few minutes to fill that, that'd be fantastic. You can also see today that we've got the Will Kidney Day background. Uh, some, of, some of you have, have, have put them on your screens and that's fantastic. Obviously it's Will Kidney Day on, on, on Thursday this week. So ourselves along with the other major kidney charities, uh, Kidney Care UK, Kidney Research, uh, British Renal Association, Kidney Wales, are do, I've, I've collaborated on this campaign uh, to, to, to raise awareness of kidneys, what kidneys do, how important they are, how lives can be devastated when they go wrong. So um, I think if, if Sophia or, or uh, Susan could drop the link in uh, to, to, to chat or Q&A, if you could go to the World Kidney Day site, you can see how you can get involved. There's, there's a, a competition where you enter a photograph to win £250. And there's lots and lots of other ways you can share facts and information on your social channels to, to help raise awareness for, for World Kidney Day. That would be fantastic. Um, and finally, I want to say thanks to the Manchester Royal Infirmary team. It's just brilliant. I know, I know you're super busy. I know you're under a lot of pressure. Um, you've given up your Saturday and all the time it's taken to um, put together your presentations and the rehearsals. Thank, thank, you know, so thanks from me. And I also want to say a, a huge special thank you to Hussein, who is absolutely fantastic to work with. And he's actually the one that's rallied all of these fantastic speakers. So a big shout out to you. Thank, thank you so much. I really appreciate it. It really didn't take a lot. Everyone was very, very keen and very happy to do it. So thank I you. I know, to but you've still had you've still you've had quite a bit to do, even in between surgery. Um, great, thanks for me. <laughs> Back to Tess. Well, I I have nothing else to say except uh, to echo what Jane just said and to thank the great team at the Manchester Royal Infirmary, uh, Hussein, Judith, uh, Sean, Nicola, Guy, and the earlier and the people who've left us already um, for giving us this uh, enormous insight into uh, this uh, extraordinary period of that we go through um, this phase of our lives as PKD patients so thank you very much and thanks also to everybody who attended and stayed with us uh, or if you just joined for the afternoon um, that's great as well I said we had over 200 people registered for it originally and people will have come in and out during the day and hopefully got out of the day what they uh, wanted from the day. Um, so yeah, enjoy your evenings and uh, stretch your legs, go out for a walk around the block, <laughs> which I'm going to do. <laughs>